Good morning. You guys awake? Well, I am honored that you are here. I'm so excited. For those of you who are first-time guests in the house, we welcome you. My name is Brittany. I am Pastor Josh's wife. And this morning, for those of you who don't know, he is still over in Israel being absolutely wrecked in his knowledge of the Bible. I feel like this is really close to my mouth. I'm going to fix it for a second. Um, And so we just want to welcome you. He will be back next week, and he would love to meet you if you need anything at all. Please let one of us know. We want to help you and encourage you along your journey here at Greenville First. And to all of our regulars, so good to see your beautiful faces this morning. And speaking of Josh, i got to get something off my chest before we get too spiritual for a moment. He's not here to even guard himself, so this is totally fun. But for those of you who don't know, we are a really big house divided when it comes to one thing. And that is college football. And I don't know if you've noticed, but your pastor literally fled the country. (laughs) Because the Clemson Tigers are going to another national championship. So, babe, we're praying for your soul. We're praying for your your willingness to be a better sport, (laughs) fleeing the country. I'm pretty sure he's probably listening right now. You guys, i got to tell you one thing, and then we really do have to get started. But I overheard him telling our five-year-old son, Cohen, you can say go Tigers on Monday night with Mama. But when you say it, I want you to spell it. G-E-A-U-X, Tigers. Are you for real right now? I said, babe. And for those of you who don't know, the LSU Tigers spell it that way, okay? So he was trying to one-up me, but he didn't get, get it past me, and I made him feel guilty because he's going to really confuse Cohen and his spelling of his sight words in kindergarten. We just mastered go, G-O, and now he's going to try to change it. Anyways, in all seriousness, I am so excited that we are in a a time at Greenville First called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. How many of you have been in the Word? You've been praying on your prayer calls, fasting? I hope so. I hope so because the Lord deserves our best. And this year, that is my hope, that we give him our best. Here at Greenville First, we always kick off January with 21 days. And if you're not a part of it, jump in. It's not too late. It goes until January 25th. And here's what that looks like. You are intentionally asking God this year, what can I change? How can I be better? How can I refocus during this time? It could be you're fasting, you're giving up something, social media, something that, that you partake in in your mouth, food. It could be time spent doing something that instead you give him that time. Whatever that looks like. There are so many things that you could do to fast and give that sacrifice to him. We have books in the lobby. We have prayer journals. We meet here on Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings. So I want to encourage you to jump in. And by the way, these cards will fast. I'm just going to point out they're not here for a mistake or out of a mistake. They're, they're there on purpose. At any time during our 21 days, we always have prayer cards here. And those are specifically for you. We want to join you and pray on your behalf. But we can't do that if we don't know your need. So please, please, please. If you have any chance today before you leave, put a need down. Leave it down here. Our staff prays all week, and during those Wednesdays and Saturday mornings, tons of people will be praying, and just we want to believe together. Amen? Amen. So last week, Josh kicked off It's Time. And It's Time has been something on our hearts that we want to use just to help not motivate you, but to grow as we grow together. Like, how do we want this year to be different than last year? We don't want Groundhog Day, right? We don't need this, this reoccurring regret that when 2021 comes, we're having the same conversation. What did I not change last year that I knew that I should have in my gut? And so it's time. Last week, Josh shared it's time to get going. He shared with us, it's time to make the move. It's time to make the change. It's time to be the difference. And he encouraged us. We are not called to short-term resolutions, but we're called to long-term habits. And I want to encourage you. This is the year. This is the year. If you're OCD like me, I'm like, 2020, clarity, vision, it all makes sense. Let's make it be the year, okay? It just makes sense. So this morning, I want to start out with a phrase. I'm pretty sure you're probably going to be able to finish the line when you hear it. Here's what it says. If you want to do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always It's not new. It's not a secret. We all know it. But why in the world do we keep doing the same thing year after year? 
And the title of my message this morning is going to be called this. It's time for God to be greater than all. There's not a parenthesis. There's not an except. It's just simply this, greater than all. And such a non-spiritual side note. How many of you by a show of hands because the teacher in me needs to know, when you see that greater than symbol, are you thinking about an alligator mouth for math class? <laughs> me too. So if I say alligator mouth today, can you not think I'm crazy? I'm tracking right here, okay? And my prayer today is that all of our life equations will say this, not compartmentalize, not, not leave a piece or a sliver out, like God, you can have all of this except, but truly all. And a lot of what I'm going to say today it's going to be familiar. But how many of you know, it doesn't matter if you are the longest believer in the room. We all, if we're breathing, we can still grow. Amen? Let's do this. Here we go. So I don't know about you, but my 12 days of January have flown. And it has been made very clear to me, if I don't take control of 2020, it's going to take control of me. Before you know it, we're going to blink. It's going to be Easter. Before you know it, we're going to blink. School's going to be out, and we're going to be cooking the turkey again, right? And I hope that your intention this year is that when December gets here, because don't blink, it's going to be, you're not the same as you are right now. In December, can we all agree? Let's be different. Let's have grown by then. And so my hope today is that when you reflect on your life, you can answer the question, does God truly have a say in all the areas of my life? Is he greater than all? But here's what I've learned. We can have all the prayer meetings. We can give all the cool books in the lobby. We can have the prayer cards and we can give the prayer journals. But it, the fish must be hungry to bite. Are you hungry today? Are you hungry this year? That is my hope for you. So how do I know? How do I know if God is greater than all? Let's be real for a second. Let's be practical. We're going to jump into a passage today in Proverbs, and it's written by King Solomon. I love it because he's not writing as a king. He's writing as a dad, and he's writing words of wisdom and advice to his son. Can we just bow our heads and pray before we get into the word today? Jesus, we thank you. God, I know that the people in this room, the people listening online, it's not a mistake that you've drawn them. It's not a mistake that they knew they had to get out of bed to be here. God, I pray today for reminders in our spirit. I pray that you would change us, make us hungry. In your name we pray. Amen. Our passage today is going to be from Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 12. And if you don't have your Bible, it's okay. It's on the screen. It says this. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything that you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God and run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything that you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. But don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child that he loves that God corrects. A father's delight is behind all of this. And as I read this passage this week, it just hit me. Solomon, in one paragraph, completely hits on four main areas of our life that will answer the question, if God is in all of these areas, my alligator mouth gets to be balanced. And today, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take Solomon's words, and we're going to cut them and dissect them into four sections and see how it applies to our life. The first one today, if you're taking notes on the app, it's time. The first area that we have to look at in our life is our time, our schedules, our priorities. He said in verse 6, listen for his voice in everything that you do, everywhere you go. I love the NIV. It says, when you acknowledge him, he will direct your path. Here's the Brittany version. When you give God your time, he's going to actually show you where to go and what to do. When you give him your time, when you actually stop trying to control your schedule and you say, God, what would you have me to do? He'll save you a lot of regret. 
When you give him your time, he'll save you the car wreck. When you give him your time, he's going to save you the mistakes. Because when we give him our time, he directs us. But we're so guilty, you guys, of waking up and going, and before you know it, our head hits the pillow again, and we never even stop to find out, oh, is that what you wanted me to do? Man, maybe if I would have consulted him, the Spirit would have checked me, and I would have done that first. He just wants to be a part of the day today in our life. So how do you arrange your time? For me, I've got to give God first, my time first. And when I say first today, if you work third shift, your first is going to be a different time of day than my first. So please make it applicable to your life. But it is no secret in my house that if I don't meet with the Lord and have my time with him before anybody else's little feet, little feet touch the floor, it simply won't happen. I can have the greatest intention. Oh, let me just... I'll sleep 30 more minutes today, and then we can put the kids to bed, and, and I'll come in here and I'll read. I don't know about you, but when my body goes horizontal, I'm gone. And I can have the greatest intention, but that, those 30 minutes are never given back to the Lord, right? It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you didn't try your hardest. It's taken me years and years to learn this. I used to say, well, I'm not a morning person, God. My best time with you is at night when I'm awake. But whatever that looks like for you, be honest with yourself. When is the best time of day? And I want to challenge you, give him that. And young people, if you guys will take notes and you will take these four areas to heart, it will be so much easier for you to do it when you're older. All four of them, if we don't get it while we're young, it's so much harder when you're older. And when it comes to time, you guys may think you're busy right now, young people. But you have more time now than you will ever, ever have again. Amen? Y'all with me? How many times have you ever been talking to someone, and they're trying to tell you a story, and, and they're trying really hard. Maybe their kid's with them, or somebody's with them, and their attention keeps getting directed, and they keep getting interrupted, and they repeat the same sentence like three and four times, and you're like, oh, my gosh. You want to meet later? You want to talk later? We don't got to do this right now. We get annoyed, right? But sometimes when we don't give God our best, many times, this is what we do to him. Think about it. You're having your quiet time, you get interrupted. Having your quiet time, you get interrupted. And finally, you probably get so annoyed yourself that you say, I'll do this later, and we never do. And then there, we just leave God, kind of in the middle of a sentence. We do that all the, we just do it all the time, and it's, it's not completely intentional. But when we can give God the first of our day, all of these things can be avoided. I love the verse in Romans 13, 11 through 12. It says, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of your day, all of your day-to-day -day obligations, that you lose track of the time and doze off oblivious to God. And we're not talking about sleeping physically, right? We're talking about spiritually. This is going, 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 going. He's trying to get in the driver's seat, but you actually won't let him. And it keeps going. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Before the phone call, before the first email, before we grab our phone like this and start scrolling social media. We're guilty of it, aren't we? Before we cut the news on, before we get out of bed to go to work or go to work, if we don't give him our first, usually all of these other things win. The day is over. How many of you guys know what we spend our time on, that's truly where our priorities lie? Pastor Chris Hodges says, don't prioritize your schedule. Schedule your priorities. What are your priorities today? Those closest to you probably can tell you. We've got to give God our first. We've got to give God our best. And I've learned if I give God my best, I actually give my best to everyone else. I'm just a better person when me and him have our date time in the morning. And everybody probably is grateful for that, <laughs> if you see me on a grumpy day. So what does this look like? When I give God my first, what, what is it seriously, very practically speaking, what does that look like? Well, spend time in the Word. It could be a verse. It could be a chapter. It could be a whole reading plan. I don't know. It's up to you. We're all on different playing fields when it comes to the knowledge of the scripture. My hope is that you would just be going deeper. Never get stuck. Go deeper from where you are now 
And in December, let's see where you are then. That's the goal. Another way is worship. I feel a whole lot different if worship is playing while I'm getting ready than something else. It just cleanses me. It just, it just makes me relax and say, God, open my mind to opportunities today. Putting some worship on. And then in prayer. You can't get to know anybody or someone if you don't talk to them. It's just as simple as that. He just wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. A time of prayer in the mornings. I love this. We're reminded in Luke 5, 16, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to the out-of-the-way out places for prayer. And it hit me like a ton of bricks when I was studying this message. Why in the world do we sometimes get up, we run out of time, we never pray, we go about our day, we come home, put the kids to bed tomorrow, repeat, 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 all in our own strength, it's Friday, and oh, I've got to get some prayer time in. This week has been nuts. Why do we think that if the Savior of the universe withdrew as often as possible to pray to God, that we somehow don't need it? The Savior of the world, 45 times in the Gospels, drew away for prayer. You guys, we need it. It strengthens, it strengthens us. There's reason behind it. I don't want to be a girl that has a prayer list like Josh talked about last week. I, I don't want to have a prayer list. I want to have a prayer life. He's not Santa. I want to have a prayer life, a constant conversation. That is, my, that is my hope. That is my goal. I don't want to be known as the person who just is going to pray during a time of crisis. No. I want to be built up before it comes. And, and I don't know if you've realized this lately, but Satan's real. He's real. And he would want nothing more than to steal your time. I talked about it last year in May. He loves when we're busy. Because when we're busy, these weapons, getting in the word, prayer, and worship, they're put to the wayside, and we are officially ineffective. And that's his goal for us. So in 2020, are you going to do whatever it takes? I'm going to ask you that over and over today. Are you going to do, are you willing to do whatever it takes? I want to see my breakthrough this year. I want to see my miracle this year. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? I want to get my answer this year. Oh, well, Brittany, you don't know. You don't know my story. I've been praying for the same thing for 20 years. I'm done. Girl, I can't do it anymore. 2020, we're done. No. Breakthrough takes persistence. And let me tell you something. In the pursuit book that we're reading, the 21 Days of Prayer Journal, it said this past week, you pray until. You pray until. You don't get to decide when. God just wants to see that you don't give up. And when you feel tired and you want to give up, then you grab a friend. And they'll pray on your behalf so you can tap out on the sideline for a second. But don't give up. Don't give up. So what are your priorities today? What are your priorities today? You've got to schedule them in the right order. Time is precious. And one final thing I have about time is as parents, let's don't forget how you prioritize your schedule. The little ones are watching, so they're learning how to prioritize theirs. This is not just like a calendar lesson today. This is legacy. You're training them to prioritize correctly. Let's make it count. Amen? In 2020, let's make God first in all that we do in our time. Let's allow that to become a part of who we are. Point two today. For God to be greater than all, we need to be careful. We need to regulate our intake. And when I say intake, you're like, oh, man, I had three donuts this morning, and she's pr praying about the intake. No. <laughs> I am talking about physically, yes, because we're called to, to be the best that we can be in our health. But I'm also talking about in our hearts and our minds. We've got to regulate what we allow inside of us. Solomon, back to his advice. He says in verse 7 and 8, Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. And here's what I know. What I'm about to say is going to sound so cliche, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Take off your cliche earmuffs. But here's what it comes down to. Our music our movies. Think about it. What are you letting inside of your mind? On social media, 
addictions that we're consumed by. What about medication? Medication's great. It helps us get better, right? But not if you're taking it and you were supposed to stop two months ago. We've got to regulate our intake. Websites we're clicking on, types of foods that we eat, all in moderation, don't worry. What about our alcohol intake? And here's, here's what I need you to know. This is not a legalistic lesson today. You're not, about to get a, you're not about to get a checklist of do's and don'ts. Because none of these things are technically bad. Oh, but they could be detrimental if they're not regulated. And so we're not trying to be legalistic today. But here's what I want you to hear. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says this. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's constructive. Just because it's okay doesn't mean it's beneficial. What lyrics, what data, what visuals are on repeat because you've let them inside and now you can't get them out. That's what happens to us, right? That's what we do. We can fill ourselves with the wrong stuff and then it's stuck. We've got to be careful of what we allow inside. We have to guard our hearts and we've got to guard our minds. My mama always said, trash in. You guys know, trash out. And when I was doing this message, I started laughing because I got to tell you, when I was growing up, and by the way, a secret about my mom, if she ever asks you a number, number, number one to whatever, her number's always three. Three, 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 three everything. Oh, girls, you can have three Oreos, not too much sugar. Everything was three in our house. I don't know where three came from. It's not in the Bible, but it's just in her little heart, and that's awesome. <laughs> everything was three, and here, here is what I know, this whole trash in, trash out. When we were growing up, three was the rule for cuss words in a movie. Brittany, you know. We'll give it a chance, but if we hear three words, we're cutting it off. And I remember me and my sister used to, oh my gosh, mom, but we really want to see this movie. So <laughs> there was one night that we were watching it and the scene got intense. Like, I don't remember, I have no idea who the character was, but I just remember that it was getting a little bit intense. And we thought, oh man, the dad's getting mad. He might cuss. And so we just muted the whole scene. Because <laughs> we did not want mom to hear any words where we could not finish the movie. And I remember giggling about that and like, oh my gosh, mom, three words, whatever. But we knew it. And she would always say, I'm sorry, girls, I know you want to see that. But I can't not let you, as your mother, fill, 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 let you fill yourselves with garbage. And, and it sounds silly then, but now that I'm a mama and I have my babies, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about the three cuss word rule, mom. <laughs> <laughs> But I've got to help them guard their hearts and their spirits because I know in stressful times and hard times, what we intake correlates with the fruit that comes out. And I need my boys to have fruit that will last them through the hard times. And that comes from within. Lord, I got my eyes all teary. I can't even see my notes. Proverbs 15, 14 says this. An intelligent person is always eager to take in more truth. Fools feed on fast food fads and fancies. The NLT version says, while the fool feeds on trash. And I don't know about you, but a lot of times in our lives, earlier when I was talking about the weapons, getting in the word, getting full of worship and, and having that time with the Lord and praying, those are weapons. And those weapons are how we fight our battles. Those weapons are how we conquer what we have going against us. And the battles that I'm referring to are here. How many of you know nine times out of ten our battles are in our own mind? We've got to guard our heart and guard our mind. In the same way I would not want a soldier on our battlefield to be filled with trash, not be trained when the battle is near. I've got to be ready. I've got to be filled with what I'm supposed to be filled with. I've got to be trained up for the battle in my mind. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
And Zach doesn't even know this, but this morning we were singing that song and it said, Strongholds Surrender. And I literally lost it because he didn't know what I was going to talk about as far as strongholds. We didn't plan that. But literally, in the Bible, it talks about he has given us the power to demolish strongholds. And that's not a word that we use a lot. Like, what is a stronghold? It is literally defined many times as a mental block. A mental block. Things in our own mind. It's nobody else's fault. It's just us. We're like in a battle with ourselves. Drives us crazy, right? You're like, oh, stop. A mental block. Materialism, atheism, secularism, attitudism. I made that one up as a mom. Attitudism. Comparison, worry, fear, guilt, approval of others, depression, you can't shake it, resentment, insecurity. You try so hard to get over it, and it keeps coming back. And here's what happens, you guys. When these things, these strongholds, they begin to consume us, and we're not trained, they will become idols in our life. And before we know it, we will be way more worried about fixing this and getting the approval in here, then getting the approval up there. They win, and we've got to be ready to fight against them. Let's take control of our strongholds in 2020. If I'm full of anxiety and fear and worry all the time and I can't ever settle with peace, maybe don't watch the news every time it comes on. If, if I'm consumed with comparing myself to others and I want their approval and I want, I want everything to look perfect, Maybe social media three hours every night is not the best fit for you and your intake. You've got to regulate what you're intaking based on what you are fighting. So my simple question is this. Does your intake help you tear down the idol and break the stronghold? Or is it feeding the monster? We're called to fight by regulating our intake and by using the spiritual weapons that he's given us. And just to go a little bit further into that when it comes to spiritual weapons and the battles, there's so many weapons the Lord has given us besides prayer and fasting that we've talked about and worship. Things like generosity, tithing, being obedient and giving. That's freeing when you actually do it. Taking communion, realizing that, God, I'm not going through the motions, but, like, I remember the sacrifice. I remember what you did for me. It just opens up our minds and our hearts to remember why we do it all. Forgiving others, it's freedom. Resolving conflict, it's freedom. Being grateful and not entitled, that'll open up your spirit. I love what Dave Patterson said in the book, in the lobby. If you did, if you did not get one for your family last week, I, I urge you. It's full of 21 days of devotions that you guys can do together. But here's what he says. The problem for many believers is that they do not access or pick up the weapons that God has furnished for the battle. They've heard about the weapons. They've read the books about the weapons. They could probably even tell you quite a bit about the arsenal. Yet those very weapons lay in the dirt or neatly packed in the closet of their spiritual life. Whether it's giving, fasting, singing, or simply telling someone that you're sorry, when we intentionally use these weapons, it activates things in the spirit realm that cannot be accessed any other way. God uses the simple to confound the wise. So as we move in to our third point this morning, I got some self-reflection questions. In your spirit, ask yourself, what is good and beneficial for me if I'm being honest? What in my intake can I cut down on or cut out altogether? If I want to change, what weapons could bring a breakthrough in my life this year? Maybe it's a weapon you've never used before. See, we don't just want to offer God our best and our time and our intake, but we also have to give him, point three, our finances. And I can't help but notice in Proverbs how Solomon tells his son, verse nine, honor God with everything that you own, Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst over and your wine vats will brim over. And here's the thing. This will be our shortest point today, and here's why. Because at the end of last year, Josh did a whole series on giving stewardship. So there's no need to camp here. That series was called Blessed. But this is a tough one for all of us. 
It's a hard one. We work really hard to get those bills paid. And for many of us, we live with a closed fist. And whether you heard that series or maybe you weren't a part of our church then or you missed it, I want to encourage you. If you will open up your hands and you will give your first, you will never, I promise, you will never be able to outgive him. Ever. Ever. And in that series, just to recap, we learned some really, really, really amazing principles about giving. First, we learned all we have is a gift. It was never ours anyways. We, we learned that when we do give, God will multiply it. We learned that giving prevents a greedy, bitter, and heavy heart. And we learned that abundance comes out of obedience. And so when I say the word finances, if you, you heard all that before, you know, you know, you know, and you're still getting anxiety. Here's what I wanna say today before we move on. I am pleading with you. If this is an area that you know, that alligator mouth, sorry Britt, I can't turn it. I can't give him that. I am pleading with you. Join a financial peace small group this semester. It will be offered more than once a semester depending on your schedule, you can find the one that best fits you. It will offer you a tangible difference in your life when you get your money in control. Otherwise, it just controls you, just like time. Hmm, what a pattern we see. I want to encourage you to find freedom in that way. Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember time? Where your time is, there's your priorities. Where's your treasure? That's your heart. This year, let's let go. Let's trust him. You'll never outgive him. The Bible teaches us we give, we save, and then we get to live. I love the story of the widow. She's surrounded by all these rich men, and they're talking about giving. Do you know that out of her poverty, she gave two coins? That's all she had. And all these men were so rich. And they said, sorry. See, teenagers, right now you may have the the least amount of money that you'll ever have. But if you'll learn now to give at the bottom, you'll remember how to give when you have more. And she gave out of her poverty, and God blessed her for that. It's all about the sacrifice. And as we close today and go into point four, God doesn't want us to compartmentalize our life and just let him into select areas. He wants to be first in it all. And the final area this morning is in our discipline. Our discipline. As Solomon wraps up his paragraph, he says to his son, don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child that he loves that God corrects. A father's delight is behind all of this. And I think for many of us, discipline is defined in so many different ways. Even in the dictionary, it says, control gained by forced obedience. Training that corrects, molds, and perfects moral character. To develop by instruction, especially in self-control. We have all sorts of meanings of what this should look like. But I want to point out the two main areas this morning of discipline. Both of which are needed and when they're present it offers great fruit when God is a part of them the first one is external discipline this is the kind of discipline like a a mom is going to discipline her child this is externally it's coming from others to you maybe from God to you and I don't know about you but I've never met anybody who was born loving discipline it's not a comfortable thing it's not normally a fun thing normally it's a humbling thing right But when God is a part of it, it's out of love. See, he allows discomfort in our life to strengthen us, to mold us. Sometimes it's to expose our our sin. And that's not to call us out or be ugly, but that's that's to protect us. Hey, you gotta stop that, you're gonna get hurt. It's just like a father, right? Sends warnings to us through discipline. But earlier when I was talking about the fish gotta be hungry to bite, the thing is, that's the same way with discipline. It's up to us how we actually receive it or if we receive it at all. I know a lot of people that receive discipline differently. Two of them are my children. Cohen, our five-year-old, when he gets maybe a yellow at school, it doesn't happen very often, but he doesn't want me to check that folder. He has all the reasons why we should look in my book bag later tonight. And when I actually have that conversation, he melts. 
He's so sorry. Mama, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. I love you so, I just love you more. He does not want to disappoint. But then there's Jensen. I call him Josh. And when Jensen gets in trouble, he doesn't cry usually. He's beginning to get a little softer. He's almost three now. But this is what Jensen does. And it's like a little, what are those animals called? Like bulls? There we go. It's like snorting, you know. And I think deep down, he really is sorry, but kind of in his head, he's trying to figure out, how could I do that again and not get caught? Oh, Jensen, you guys better pray for him. But seriously, we control how we receive the discipline, right? And the other kind of discipline that we want to hit on this morning is internally. Internally. And see, I think that there's a difference, a huge difference in external and internal. And I'll just say this to bridge the two. You ever seen a child or a teenager or, or someone younger who... They have all the freedom in the world. The parents don't care what they do. They don't care when they come home. It's more like a friend thing than a parent thing. And for a short term, in a short time, that's fun. But even for that kid with all the freedom, he sees their friends who have curfews or have rules and have structure, they begin to wonder, hmm, that doesn't look so bad. You ever noticed that before? Because discipline it makes us secure in ourself. It, it reminds us that we're loved. It's not fun all the time, but I know that I'm cared for. It, it begins to show us like, oh, I have a purpose to live. I'm worth more than this. I have confidence in myself. And so it's very much needed that we have the external discipline, but it's very needed that we have the internal. And that's what we do to ourself self-discipline. See, I think that many times, here's where this one gets paused and stuck. Well, Brenna, you don't know my story. Like, I grew up this way, and, and, and this is the season that I'm in, and this happened to me, and I couldn't help that, and she said this, and whatever. We are not a product of our circumstances. We are a product of our discipline. You can control anybody else, but you can control you. And I don't know about you, but in 2020, I want the best for my life. I want to do what God has called me to do, and I'm not letting anybody stop me from doing what He's called me to do. No one can take that away from you. No one. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 11, at the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Oh my gosh, have you guys ever done Whole30? That diet, it's awful. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely. For it's, well it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. We know in Proverbs, the farmer, if he doesn't have discipline, he's not going to have food in the, in the fall. He's not going to have food to harvest. A runner is probably not going to make it to the finish line if they don't train for the marathon. See, we are called to live intentionally. Our days are numbered. They're ordained by God, but they're numbered and they matter. And you are worth more than living swayed by the wind, not having a plan. We've got to have a set of disciplines that we do every day. Every day. Because you matter more than that, quite frankly. I love the quote, the undisciplined are slaves to their moods, their appetites, and their passions. And many times I think we get discouraged and disciplined because we do this and we do that and whatever, and we don't see any difference. And the Bible reminds us, just like the farmer, you plow anyway. Take another swing. Do it every day. I encourage you. You're not going to lose 50 pounds in a day. I wish you did. But it's just simply not the way it is. And you know why? Because we wouldn't be molded or strengthened or learned anything if it was. It's all about the process that discipline takes us through. What are you learning? How are you being molded right now? How are you being strengthened in your discipline? I love this from John Maxwell. Motivation gets you going, but discipline keeps you growing. Self-discipline is the ability to make yourself do what you should do, when you should do it, 
whether you feel like it or not. Okay, Brittany, I hear you. But, but like, what disciplines are you talking about? Where do I start? Three practical areas as we close today. Be self-disciplined in your life with the Lord. Get to know Him. Get to know Him. He honestly wants the best for you. He's got a purpose for you. Jeremiah tells us He has a hope and a future. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. Get to know Him. The second area for self-discipline. Live beyond yourself. Do something for other people. Every day, love those who are closest to you. Do something kind for someone. Do something not for yourself. You're going to get nothing out of it. But you'll absolutely get something out of it. Self-discipline comes. Getting to know the Lord. Helping others. And the last way is taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself. Yes, and your health. Regulate that intake. That matters. Self-discipline. Exercise in a practically, practical way of speaking. But beyond your body, find a hobby that just fills you with life. You're allowed to have fun. Do something for yourself. I urge you, join a small group. Get surrounded by a body, a, a community of people who have things in common with you. You'll find freedom there. Another way that you could help take care of yourself is to get accountability. Find someone in your life that you can go to. When you're thinking about the areas of your life, maybe you have problems with your intake. Maybe you seriously need, need to get help with that. Maybe you have more questions about your finances and how that God could be greater in that area. Maybe in self-discipline. It's easier to go with somebody to the gym than going by yourself. Consistency is key. But accountability is crucial in taking care of yourself. We're not called to do this alone, ever. So I encourage you this morning, in these four areas of our life, how does your alligator mouth look today? One out of four, two out of four, looking good, four out of four. As we wrap up, I just wanna give you this closing statement that just kind of culminates everything that we've talked about, just kind of seals it in our spirit. When my time is aligned with God, I'm intaking health and truth to my heart and my mind, which allows me to begin to truly trust Him in the hard areas like generosity. And then I began to appreciate discipline instead of despising it because I know my purpose and who I am in Him. See you guys, Solomon wrote this wisdom in 700 BC, well over 2,000 years ago. How crazy is it that he spoke to time, intake, finances, and discipline? God's truth doesn't change. He knew those areas will get us if we don't get them. That long ago, why do we have to keep learning the hard way? 700 BC? Are you willing to do whatever it takes this year? In 2020, will God be greater than all? And I'm just going to ask you for a moment as we close. Can we just close our eyes, bow our heads? As we seal this together, I think that there are two groups of people in the room. Those who know, yep, I'm a believer. I know the Lord. You've checked my spirit. I could be a little more consistent in one of some of the areas. got to make sure God is greater than all. I want to encourage you. Take it to heart today. Be obedient in what the Lord is speaking. But there are others in the room that quite frankly, you have no idea how to balance this out because you have never made a decision to follow Christ. And I want to encourage you and let you know that He has given you a purpose. He wants the best for you. God sent His Son to literally die for you so that you did not have to go through all of the heartache and the mistakes on your own. He wants to be there and give you strength through it all. And so my question is, if, if you're getting checked in your spirit and your heart, you know that you've got to make a change this year. Brittany, I'm doing it. I'm deciding today, this is my year, and you want to make a decision to follow Christ today for the first time. Would you just raise your hand and wave at me? Nobody's looking around. Nobody's looking around. Yeah. I'm going to give you a, sec a second. 
because you matter. You are so valuable to him. Amen. Can we all just say this prayer together? Jesus, I need you. I want to live for a higher purpose than myself. Come into my life today. Forgive the old and make me new. Help me to love and trust you so that I can allow you into all the areas of my life.